somebody thought at the end of my message last night that daddy was here. They said every usher in the usher room about passed out when daddy's voice came on last night. But if he is here, that's the songs he'd be singing. Then he'd start, everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. Yes, we will shout and sing our prayer. baptized me in the name of Jesus. And he said, ever since that day, God touched my life. Then he'd say, he anointed me to preach his word. He anointed me to proclaim the gospel. Therefore, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Yes, now, Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Oh, Jesus, I'll never Brother William for that word. What a great word from the Lord. We're not giving honor to the man, but we're giving honor to the word that he preached. Could we give that to the man? So very glad to have all of you with us. Thank you for coming year after year and time after time. Thank you for coming to Because of the Times. You just bless us so very much here at the POA. You know, everybody says what a blessing it is for us to you. You don't realize what a blessing you are with what you bring to this little town of Alexandria when all of you arrive. It, uh, it's a blessing to us in this church, and I thank you for that very much. I'm thankful for my pastor, Brother Tenney. He's such a great man of God.
He will go down as one of the greats that's been among us, and I thank God for him. We're very honored to have with us two former general superintendents as our guests, Brother Robert Martin, Brother Steve Wilson. Would you wave your hands, please? We're very glad to have you all from the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus. And if the men would stand on the platform and remain standing just a moment, our superintendent had to leave. Brother Gleason, our assistant superintendent, hold your applause to the end. Brother Kevin Borders, our executive presbyter. Brother Philip Harrison, our executive presbyter. Brother Aaron Soto, sitting down there because he's a little cripple, but he's an executive presbyter. Brother Raymond Woodward, an executive presbyter. Our Globe and Missions, Brother Bruce Howe. Uh, and Brother Scotty Slayton, the secretary, plus six of our regional directors are here, to which we're thankful for home missions. Brother Carlton Kuhn and Brother Bill Hobson. Uh, Sunday School, Brother Steve Cannon. The youth, Brother Mike Enzi and Brother Matt Johnson. The ministry directors of, uh, of our organization, Brother Kenneth Stewart. Brother Raul Arsico, Brother Dan Hanscom, and Brother Tom Foster. And of course, in this district, we have two great men leading us in my district superintendent, Brother Kevin Cox, and our district superintendent, Brother Randy Hopper. And we've got many members of our district board here, and I would like for them to stand likewise. This could not happen without the Louisiana district, and I thank God. Would you give the Louisiana district? We had another one. We had 46 general board members here this year. Aren't we thankful about that? We're having, we're having. I want to tell you, I don't say much about what we've done, but the Lord really moved on me at, at Christmas season, and I preached a series of message called The Cradle, Cross, and Crown. And uh, I don't usually say much about that, but uh, on the cross and the crown, it's something that would be very valuable for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday morning. I don't know that I've had a greater anointing when I preach the message than that. Barbara Nichols' funeral pastor, Terry, came to me after it's over. He said, you need to mention that. Uh, when I, you've heard Barbara referenced by me and mother. Maybe a funeral you want to take home. It's something that God just anointed me with in there. And then you heard Daddy's voice last night. Some, some people thought I had Jacob Tapica do that, but that was really Daddy. But uh, Daddy preached that. What I got that from was um, Daddy's message on the unknown soldier. How many has not heard that message? Would you raise your hand? L let me, just let me say this. I wouldn't even fool with the CD. You need to watch what my dad did. That message will go down as one of the greatest apostolic messages that's ever been preached. So all of that is available over in the bookstore and uh, particularly the unknown soldier. Please get the DVD. Daddy did everything. He didn't tell me. He didn't tell mother. He got with our drama director. He built the tomb. They did. He had soldiers come in from the National Guard. They marched the whole time he preached. I watched it two times last week. I mean, it was just so moving to me. It is one of the greatest messages. In fact, when Daddy walked out, I was, a lot of what he said last night, he spoke from that prayer room. He wasn't even in the congregation. I thought he was either going to walk out and be raptured or either God was taking him because it was that powerful of a message. I would love for every young man that I have any influence over, if you can't afford it, we'll make sure you get it. But everybody needs to watch that message. It's one of the greatest apostolic messages that's ever been preached. We begin in the morning at 9.30. You say panel and you say I'm sleeping in. This is one panel session you do not want to sleep in on. It is uh, Brother Mike Williams will be moderating it. It is uh, Brother Cornwell. It is Brother Mark Morgan. And it is Brother Hargrove. And uh, we chose that, uh, Mike, myself, and Terry, and, and Brother Tenney, we chose this for a reason that all day tomorrow is going to tie together. And uh, you won't want to miss tomorrow. The forum is going to tie in with, I've asked Brother Getty to preach a message I heard him preach, and I'm sure he will uh, make it custom for because of the time, but I heard him preach it in Manila, and it was powerful. And then Brother Huntley always blesses. us. Then tomorrow night, you, you don't understand what we felt when we planned this day and night. When God gets through with Brother Cunningham tomorrow night, there will be a mass deliverance in this place. 
We saw it with the ladies tonight. It's going to happen to our entire families. It's going to happen to our churches. And you're going to leave here with a fresh anointing tomorrow night, to which I'm, I'm thankful for. The man of God, after the choir sings, that's coming to preach to us. I love him very much. I just preached his church dedication. Elias Lamonis came here. What year was it, Brother Lamonis? 1990. He was working for the Coca-Cola Company, uh, young ministers, uh, men that don't know which way you're going. He came to because of the times that God spoke to him, and he was an executive with uh, moving up to an executive point with Coca-Cola Company. And God spoke to him to start a church. And uh, he went back home, and he went in and told his boss, I'm resigning, I'm going to start a church. He said, you're crazy. He said, we're moving you into six figures. He said, you, possibility you'll be moving to Atlanta, Georgia as one of our major distributors, leaders, executives for Coca-Cola Company. He said, okay, I'll stay with you. That lasted for about a day or two. He can share that if he chooses to. And he walked back in and he threw those keys down his desk. He said, I gotta go start a church. That was in 1990. And when I preached his dedication of his brand new building, they had somewhere between 12 and 1400 there that night. And I thank God for this man of God. And before he preaches, we're going to lift up the name of the Lord in song. And then God's going to visit us in another great way. Amen.
Hallelujah. Put your hands together and give him praise one more time. Give him the praise that he deserves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you glory, oh God. We give you glory, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In this kind of atmosphere, the level of faith, the anointing is flowing in such a way that anything can happen tonight. There's great things is already happening. There's healings that have taken place. Emotional healings already have taken place. God has healed our minds. Not done yet. Tell somebody he's not through with us tonight. And uh, and you know, after what the Lord just has spoken to us through our brother Williams, you know, I stay here tonight. I want you to allow me for a few minutes to kind of unburden my heart to you. Would you please take a seat? And uh, in First Chronicles char- chapter 27, we can read, I'm just going to pick up a few verses here. I'm going to read 25 and over the kings of the treasure was Asmabed in verse 26 of First Chronicles, Chronicles 27, 26. And over, and over the work of the field, for the tillage of the ground was as right. Verse 27, and over the vineyards was Shammai. Verse 28, and over the olive trees and the sycamore trees that were in the low plains was Baal Hanan. And over the cellars of oil, Joash. At the moment of the reading this chapter, David was up in years. He was old in those days. as a shepherd boy tending the sheep of his father. Exploits of the killing of the bear, the lion, even Goliath, those days when he was fleeing from Saul like a wild animal, hiding himself in the mountains, in the caves. All those experiences, the moment of the reading this scripture, were a distant memory in his mind. Now David had returned to Jerusalem to establish his kingdom. First Chronicles 18 and 1 tells us that David subdued the Philistines. This is the first time in the biblical history that the Philistines have been subdued. David is Moab, and now Moab is no longer an enemy. The Syrians have been conquered. And in 1 Chronicles 18 and 13 says that the Edomites have been subdued and became David's servants. And David reigned over all Israel. So finally, David had reached a place in his life. Where he had no more enemies to fight. He had conquered them all. And him and his mighty warriors had returned home. They were entering into a new season in their lives. No more battles to fight. No more kingdoms to conquer. They have accomplished in the natural what the New Testament says we are supposed to accomplish in the spiritual. The kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. They were violent men. And they had taken the kingdom by force. They had subdued all their enemies. These men knew nothing but to fight. They were brutal. They were acid. They were so acid that anywhere they spit, the grass dried up. They kill everything they move. They kill. And now, after 40 long years, Years of constant battle. They are back home, back in Jerusalem. This time to never, ever again step into the battlefield. They never again will return home. Blood is splattered and bruised up and cut up like countless times before. Most of them, undoubtedly, all these warriors have members and their bodies missing. All of them, I'm sure, they have scars in their faces. Some perhaps one, had one ear missing. Some others have fingers and both of their hands missing. Maybe some having a whole arm missing. But now it was a new day. 
Now, it was a new season in their lives. It was a time of restoration. It was a time of recompense. It was a time for them to be rewarded for their loyal service to their king. They were ready to settle down. They were ready to enjoy their families, their wives, their children and grandchildren. They were ready to build a home. David had come to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem, and he did. And in our text tonight, in the whole chapter of Chronicles chapter 27, and I know I'm preaching to preachers. I know I'm preaching to pastors. I know I'm preaching to people that know this creature. So I don't have to dwell on this chapter too much and explain to you every detail of it. But just let me get down to what I'd like to say for you, to you for a few minutes here tonight. This is the chapter of recompense. And it, 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 it was payday, so to speak, for David's mighty warriors. They are about to enter into a time of amazing reward from their king. It was a time of, of excitement. It was a time of wonderment. There was an atmosphere of expectation in the camp of Israel. Because each of those loyal Warriors were expecting to receive high rewards from their king. For 40 long years, they have put their lives in the line for their king. And so now they are ready to receive from him their recompense. And they were excited to say the least. But not only they were full of excitement, but even their wives and their children, their whole family, for so long they have lived like a nomads, moving from one place to another place. But now they are at the verge of experiencing a major change in their lives. And in that group of warriors was a man named Joash. He too, like the rest, was expecting the king to assign him to a lofty position in the kingdom. Well, after all, Joash said to himself, he knows, you know, David, my king, he knows me by my first name. He knows that I'm a loyal man. He knows who I am. He knows I am well qualified to fulfill any of those great positions in the kingdom. But here comes my first point. In this kingdom, we don't have the luxury to choose who sits on the right or who sits on the left. Those places are given to them for whom are being prepared, the Lord said. We need to stop qualifying ourselves and let him do the qualifying. Because our standard of qualifying people is, is totally different than, than the his standard of qualifying people for kingdom purposes. Peter, John, the rest of the apostles who had never qualified to be the speaker in the first BOTT in the upper room 2,000 years ago if the qualifying would have been left to us. But all those 12 men that the Lord Jesus chose became the pillars of this kingdom. Thank God it's him and not us who does the, who does the qualifying. I wouldn't be here tonight if you would have been doing the qualifying. Because we only always thinking more about ourselves than others. And we are, we have our own standards of qualifying people for kingdom purposes. And Joas had built the, his hopes up. Thinking that he was going to be placed in a lofty position in the kingdom. And not only him, but his family, I'm sure. If that happens, and, and we will be moving to the palace. We'll be moving right next, live right next to the king. So everybody was excited. And finally, finally, the great day came. Joas arrived really early to the meeting. And many more of the elite warriors joined him in the room. And there was a lot of talking going on, a lot of noise in that meeting room. And so the spokesman of the king begins the meeting. It makes everybody to settle down, to be quiet. After all, they were not well-mannered men. They had been in the battlefield all of their lives practically. They didn't know how to behave in that kind of setting. They were loud mouth. They were very impatient. Finally, after many tries, the spokesman finally got, in, got them to be silent. And he was silent in the room. And so the, the, the spokesman of the king clears his throat. 
and he began to call name after name. One by one, he's given out the wishes of the king for each of them. They had fought right alongside of him for four long decades. A name after name had been called. And, and after many hours, perhaps, they were waiting patiently. Seeing. Few positions were left. It. And the most prominent jobs had already been given out. And there is Joash waiting Nothing. His name had not been called. He's very, he's losing his patience. He's nervous. By this time, he had eaten all of his nails because he was so nervous. At what time they're going to call my name? When my name is going to be called, all the good positions have already been taken. And perhaps I am the most qualified. And finally, almost at the end of the day, he was one of the last ones to be called out. And he took the, <clears throat> the sportsman, lift up his voice. Finally, he called his name. Josh! Boy, he was way back there. He, he, he stands up. His heart is pounding. His knees are shaking. Just like when they call you, it says, you have been chosen to speak up because of the times. Forget about Thanksgiving. Forget about Christmas and New Year's. Everything you do, you think, I got to preach. And because of the times. So his knees are shaking. His heart is pounding. And he comes forward to the podium to receive his assignment. Finally, he's saying to himself, my, 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 my purpose in the kingdom has arrived. And the spokesman of the king raises up his voice. Drum roll, drum roll. The drums are sounding. And he said, Joash, is the king wishes for you to be over the sellers of oil of the king. And it was probably this quiet that day. And Joash thinks there must be some mistake. Something is wrong. This king not be right. And he looks back to the spokesman of the king. He says, sir, excuse me, but there might be a mistake on this choice. Can you look it over? So he came back and he turned on his iPad because he has went off. And, and he looks over his notes and says, there's no mistake. The wishes of the king is for you to be the seller of oils. Oh, that's your great assignment in the kingdom. That's the king wishes for you, Joash. And Joash dropped his head, put his hands on his pocket. He turned around, disappointing. He was sad. He was thinking, what am I going to say to my wife? What am I going to say to my friends? I had built their hopes up. They were expecting that I be assigned to a big, lofty position in the kingdom. They, they thought we were moving up, but instead we are moving down. Because there's nothing lower than the sellers of oil. That was the lowest part of the city of Jerusalem. But why should we criticize Joash for his reaction? If we react the same way or even worse... Because the concept of success in ministry today is to be high, a high profile preacher. Or the concept of success in ministry today is to pastor a huge mega church. And there's nothing wrong with that. I want to pastor a mega church, but that's the concept of it. Or the concept of success in ministry today is for someone to be jet setting from one conference to the next. To have the spotlight always shining right on your face. When success truly is fulfilling the wishes of the king for the advancement of his kingdom. That is success. The king says, whoever, whoever wants to be great among my kingdom has to become a servant, has to become an oil keeper and the sellers of the king. We are not building our kingdom. We are building his kingdom. 
And somebody has to keep the sellers of oil. Because if there's no oil, there's no anointing. Without oil, our messages will become speeches. Without oil, our worship will become a concert. Without oil, we become a tinkling symbol and a sounding brass. Does anybody here is interesting to become a keeper of the sellers of oil of the king? I know we all have our dreams and our visions. I know I'm preaching to young preachers. I'm not old enough perhaps. I'm, I'm going to be 56 years old here in a few days. I was, I was a 30 year old young man in 1990. When I came for the first time to be cause of the times. And I wanted, like Sister Besta Manga said it this morning. I wanted to do something in the kingdom of God. I was hungry. I had a deep, genuine desire to do something in the kingdom of God. I was not the most qualified person. I sat right there uh, in, the, in, in the left side of the building. I didn't know anybody. Nobody knew me. I was just a hungry young man that wanted to do something for God. So I want to talk to some young preachers here today. Oh, I used to love it when they say, everybody under 40 stand up. Oh, for 10 years I stood up. I was happy. And then I reached 40 and 41. And I was just looking around the young crowd. Now I'm 56. Time has gone by. It's been a long, I don't know my prime, but 56 has been 25 years ago. Oh, the cellar was the lowest part of the city. Just let me preach for a few minutes here. It was a cold place. It was an isolated place. It was a dark place. He, he, it was not a small place. In fact, it was like a city underneath the city of Jerusalem. He had passages. He had tunnels. He had warehouses, chambers. It was a place where few visitors ever came. It was dark and it was silent. But above in the city was business as usual. Jewish friends were enjoying the banquets. They were Facebooking every move they made. And like Brother Dean said it this morning, they, even, they were Facebooking even what they were eating for dinner every night. Oh, I enjoy Brother Dean. I don't know where he's at. And, oh, if his friends were taking selfies. So the whole world can see their successes and what they were doing. And there's nothing wrong with the social media. There's nothing wrong with technology. In fact, I thank God for the modern resources he has placed in our hands. We can use it for evangelism. And we can use those things for kingdom purposes. I don't want to sound like a dinosaur here tonight. But I just wonder how many of us we spend as much time in the cellars of oil as we spend in things that don't have any kingdom purposes. God needs to touch us one more time. We've been hearing, my Lord, after last night's messages. I called my wife and said, I'm ready to go home. I felt the same thing I felt 25 years ago. I don't know how so many can come out year after year to this kind of atmosphere and this kind of preaching. Year after year. They go back home and they don't do anything. Oh, it was my first time in 1990. After you finished preaching, I said, Sister Man can preach about praying and so winning. I didn't have no more tears to shed. I went home and I said, we making some changes. I don't care what I have to do. I want to do something for the kingdom if you don't do something when you leave this conference you are wasting your time and you are wasting your money listen you need to go back and you need to do something hallelujah please don't misunderstand me today I'm extremely so thankful for our buildings. Thank you for coming and dedicate hours 
awesome musicians and singers. The best technology the world can offer. We have it in our churches. It's great. We have great programs. We have great seminars. We have great leadership conferences. All the best of the best. But if we don't have underneath, in the basement, in the foundation, in the cellars of our fancy buildings, in our fancy programs, in our fancy music, and underneath our titles and positions, the most important substance, oil. If we don't have oil, then the only thing we have is nice things. And we cannot build the kingdom of God on nice things alone. We must God. And we will have the oil of the anointing, the oil of the spirit. We must have it. Because the kingdom of God has been said already. It's not me, no drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy. And the Holy Ghost, clap your hands. Give him praise for just a moment. The greatness of this church. Every time we come to Alexandria, this little town here in, in central Louisiana, the greatness of this church, the influence of this church in this city, in this state, in the, in the, in the whole world, in the apostolic movement, in the whole world, is tributary. Not only to its great leadership throughout the years. We heard so many times Bishop Mangan and Sister Be Bester Mangan. She said it this morning. The first thing they did when they came to Alexandria to this place was to put a foundation of prayer and fasting and passion for souls in the city. And I truly, truly believe that if we get... Uh, uh, Right now, we, there's a way that we can get a big old uh, drill. You know, those that you drill for, for oil and all that. And the, and the oil fills. If we get one of those huge, humongous drill. And we drill a hole right in the middle of this altar. You know what would happen? A big stream of anointing oil will gush out of from the arnet underneath of this foundation because they have been here some keepers of oil they have been praying throughout the years every day every week every month every year there are hundreds of people. There are hundreds of keepers of oil. There are hundreds of young men, young women, mothers, fathers. They pray every day behind the scenes. They will never stand on this platform and preach. They will never teach here. But behind these men of God and behind these other men of God, they are people. They are fasting. They are praying. They are lifting the name of the Lord every day so these two men can stay here on Sunday and Lift up their voices and say, Thou says the Lord. The public ministry of a preacher will never exceed to his private life. It's not what you do in public, but what you do in those secret places, in the cellars. That will produce great apostolic revival in our cities. I'm not nobody here to tell you what to do. I'm just a simple man. But God has chosen me tonight. And just allow me a few moments to tell you. We must have. I discovered the secret 25 years ago. And I did something with it. I didn't just go home and just keep going to, through my routines and do with what I was doing. No, no, no. I said, we got to make some changes here. We love the Lord. We, we working for the Lord. I thank God for my brother-in-law, Brother Cunningham's my brother-in-law. I highly respect him. I love him. There's, I don't know any other most generous man than Brother Cunningham. I love him like my own brother. It's not even, I don't even call him brother-in-law. I call him my brother. So I got a big brother here. If you mess with me, I just put him in front of me. But 
boy, he came. We were struggling. And I say, he, and, and he came in 1980. In 86, we started the church. In 88, he came and he was a home missions church. And, and he says, can you come and preach my revival? I don't have much money to pay you. But can you come? And, and he says, don't worry about it. He showed up. He is a generous man. And he preaches that revival, I remember. We went and gathered people from everywhere. We dragged them in. We just forced them to come in. We just, we just want to fill the house so the men of God can come and preach to a group of people. 31 people received the Holy Ghost that day. And that's how everything started. And then we got stuck with 31 to 40. And then when I came in 1990 and everything broke loose. Because if there's something that breaks the yoke, it's the anointing. That's what I read somewhere in this book. That the anointing is the thing that destroys the yokes in people's lives. The anointing is the thing that is going to help us to overcome anything that comes against us. Against our marriages. Against our children. Against our congregation. The thing that's going to help us overcome is the oil of anointing. It's not going to be our talent. It's not going to be our knowledge. It's not going to be our popular abilities. It's going to be the anointing of God. Give me a man with the anointing. I take him any time than anybody else that knows how to do and this pop the right thing. I want the anointing. Is anybody here wants to become a keeper of the sellers of the oil of the king? Because the oil activates the apostolic ministry in the church. He activates apostolic revival in the church because the apostolic ministry does not depend on charisma, or eloquence, or experience. It exclusively depends, exclusively depends on the power of the Holy Ghost. When I came to you, the apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom but in a demonstration of the spirit and of the power that your faith that the superintendent preached to us last night that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God hallelujah hallelujah yes Josh Joash relies that he had the better portion in the kingdom. At first he was so disappointed. But later on, he started realizing this might not be the most visible position. And now with the elite crowd up above. But I think I got the best in the kingdom. Because at the end of the day, after thousands of olive trees had been gleaned and had been crushed. Through. They brought the oil to Josh. And I can see him. He's stacking on the warehouse. Barrel after barrel. Every time he put one up. There was oil spilling all over him. Every time he put one up. There was oil spilling. So he called his wife. And he calls. I help me to put this fourth one up on top. And they go out. And they all get bathed with oil. So at the end of the day. The herd was oily. The clothing was oily. Every time they walked, it was shh, shh, shh. Because the oil got underneath the shoes. It was an oily family. But what a good thing. I rather had the anointing in my family, in my life, than anything else in this world. Because it's the anointing that breaks yokes. And what is being worked out on the cellars, eventually will resurface. He'll come, on to, he'll come on to the surface. He'll come up to the surface. Whatever is worked out on the cellar. As a matter of fact, the light in the temple came from the oil that was down in the cellars. In fact, the whole city of Jerusalem and the households in the streets, it was lighted up with oil everywhere. There was light in the city because there was somebody working and the sellers. And we want to light up our cities. We need to reach our cities. We need to keep the oil going underneath. 
And when they, we need to keep the oil going underneath so this light can shine up above. It's a keeper of the sellers of oil that keep the light burning in the temple. Somebody had to keep the light burning in the church. See, the anointing of God is not coming on me tonight preaching in this unbelievable place. In this platform where great men of God have stood many times before. Where there's a prophet that preaches in this pulpit Sunday after Sunday. Great men of God, pastors and ministers of this church. The anointing of the Holy Ghost doesn't come from these public places. And I know there are young preachers that, oh, someday I want to be there. Oh, don't wish. Why don't you just wish the seller? Because he that sees you in secret. We'll reward you in public. You take care of the secret stuff. You take care of the seller. You take care of your prayer and your fasting. And the Lord will take care of the rest. He will give you revival. He will give you growth. He will give you a great church. He will keep your family safe. He'll provide the resources for everything you want to do. If you just keep your prayer. If you just keep your life. And your heart, like the priest, was pure and clean before the Lord. Hallelujah. But isn't the seller that you face? Faith is renewed. It's where you get your strength to keep moving forward. Isn't the seller of prayer and fasting? Is that you? This, that's where you get the spiritual recharge and encourage. It's not the mountain tops of successes. That brings great anointing upon our lives. But isn't the burdens of reaching our cities and evangelize our communities and to help those that are living in darkness what produces the oil of anointing in our lives. That's what produces the anointing in our lives. It's died down in the cellar. And I thank God for everything. I really do. I mean, I, I, I came yesterday after this service. I didn't have enough more tears to shed this morning after Sister Mangan preached. It was the same way. She imparted something to me. Tonight, Brother Shotwell came and imparted something to me. I'm so full. I want to go home already. I got to do something. I got to get busy. I got to get right there in the cellars again. I got to evangelize. I got to do the things I got to do. Yes, we have families to take care of. We got grandchildren to take care of. If we're going to do that, we're going to have a good time. We're going to have our time small. We're going to go out. We're going to do all those things. But please don't get away from the cellars of praying and fasting and searching and seeking the face of the Lord. That's where the secret a revival is. That's where the secret of success, using the word tonight, is. It's not in public places. It's in those secret places. So home missionaries. I was there one time. I, I am a church planter. Pastors that perhaps seen, have not seen the results that you've been wishing to see throughout the years. And you came to this conference and you are a little frustrated and you don't know what to do. And you are asked a question you called today. You are questioning if you really heard from God to go to the city to start a church. Let me assure you. It's a confirmation coming away in this conference. It's a reassurance to you calling. If you have not received it, it's coming. Because the Holy Ghost is here. The presence of God is here. The power of God is here. The anointing of God is here. It, there is a reassurance coming for, for you to go back and, and do the will of the king in your life. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Keep praying. Keep fasting. Keep preaching. Keep reaching. Keep magnifying the Lord. Keep praising him like there's no tomorrow. Keep worshiping like it's your last day in this earth. Do everything with passion. Do everything with your heart. Do everything with everything that is within you. Don't stop. Keep moving. Keep going up. Keep moving forward. Don't stop. Hallelujah. Go to all the comforts you can go. Read all the books of, on church growth that you can read. But after you've done all of that, make sure you have underneath of all the knowledge, 
your own cellar, your own place of prayer, your own place of fasting. Because that's where you get ideas for your ministry. That's where you get direction for your church and for your life. That's where you renew your mind that you might know what's the perfect will of God for you. And as far as it, you know, how am I going to finance my dream? How am I going to finance the building that I want to build? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. How am I going to do it? Don't worry about it. When Solomon built the temple, the Lord told David, you are bloody man. You cannot build me a house, but your son will. And there came the day when Solomon was ready to build the building. And in, 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 in 2 Chronicles 2, he asked this king of Tyre, Huran, he says, I want you to send, send me all these materials and send me people with the skills so they can work on the wood and they can work with the gold and they can work with the silver. And then he said these words in verse 10. And I will pay your people. I will pay the labor of them with barley, with wheat, with wine, and with 20,000 bats of oil. 20,000 bats of oil is equivalent at 180,000 gallons a day. Wow. How are you going to pay it? You keep praying and you can fasting. You keep producing oil, and the oil will produce the resources. Yeah, you got to get out the cellar. You got to move in faith. You got to evangelize. You got to mobilize. But the, what it produces, the resources, is right there. A hundred and eight. I can see when they came and knocked the door of the cellar. And he opened up the door. <laughs> And he was the emissary of the king. And he says, I, I'm coming on the name of the king. We need 180,000 gallons of oil to pay the bill for the, the, the construction of the beautiful temple for the worship of God. And I can see Josh with a big old grin, with a big old smile on his face. <laughs> oh, now I understand. Now well, I didn't see before. The first time when they called me, I didn't see these. But now I see my purpose. Tell the king, oh, I have 180,000 gallons of good oil, anointed oil, fresh oil, so he can pay the bill. You don't know how to pay your bills. Keep praying and fasting. And the Lord of heavens, he owns everything. He will provide the resources for you to for you to accomplish the vision that the Lord has given you. You think that this building just showed up? No. There's, there's a givers of sellers. That's where you see this temple. We come in here and we go, whoa. But it doesn't show up like that. There's people there have been underneath. Cry now when you're asleep. Cry now when we're eating and playing. There's people crying out, look what the Lord has done. But if the Lord did it here, he can do it for us wherever we are. Whether it's here in the United States, whether it's overseas, I don't care what it is. These works everywhere because our king, his kingdom is all over this world. It's not limited to only the United States of America. My father was the first apostolic preacher in South America. In 1958, he was pastoring a Baptist church in the city of Guayaquil, Ecuador. ¿Cuántos, cuántos Latinos hay aquí? Griten amén. A few people don't respond. I'm preaching Spanish. They will respond. And you're in trouble. You know. My dad, 1958, brother draws from Colombia and two other preachers came down to South America, to, to Ecuador in South America, little country. And they witnessed to him about the, the oneness of God in Acts 38. My dad was a student of the Bible. He says, I'm, I'm not going to refute this because it's right there on the word. But let me pray and let me study. After two weeks of praying and fasting, my dad was a man that prayed and fast. He called Brother Jaws and the other two men and says, I'm ready. I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. So they came back from Colombia and they baptized my father in the precious name of Jesus. And he received. 
the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of it speaking with another tongues. The apostolic church was born that day. God, it, 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 the persecution has started and all these things have started. But what I want to tell you is this. Oh, this kingdom, the power of this kingdom is everywhere. And my dad taught me these things. He, he showed me these things. And we, we heard about Brother Dean and Brother, oh, what we heard last night. It was so moving. It was so powerful. But I'm going to tell you, that's what the secret is. These great men that gone before us, that's all they knew how to do. Pray, fast, evangelize, teach Bible studies, love people, love souls, preach on Sunday, go back to praying and fasting, love people, evangelize, love people and tell them, love people. That's all they knew how to do. And they built great churches. And the gospel is all over this world because People like that, they knew how to keep the sellers of oil. Because some of them will never speak in a general conference. Will never stand behind my pulpit like because of the times. But they are so vital for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Everything we do in the kingdom of God is to please him. Joas, Joas, I'm sure he never got a plaque. He never got a recognition. He never, nobody said anything, nobody visited him. But he was keeping the seller of the oil, the thing that provided light to the city and to the temple. He knew that it was not about him, but it was about the king business and the well-being of others. He was a kingdom mind and person because he did not care if they, somebody came and says hey good preaching hey you did good yeah. he didn't care about any of those things he just oh he was just happy there was light up above there was light in the temple there was the anointing that breaks the yoke he was just happy to fulfill it, the wishes of the king and tonight I like to challenge every one of us here today if we are fulfilling the wishes of the king we are successful Sometimes, sometimes the smoke is not coming out of my ship and it's not a smoke. Sometimes we are so worried. Who gets the credit for this? Who gets the credit for God? Hey, in this kingdom, if he gets the credit, hallelujah, praise the Lord. If his name is lifted up, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Who cares who gets the credit? If my picture is not in the flyer, I'm not coming to the meeting. If they don't call me and they put me to do something, I'm not showing up. Hey, we're not building our kingdoms. We're building his kingdom. And he must to increase. And I, my ego has to be smashed. And I must to decrease. And if he is increasing, in me, everything that I touch is increasing. Every word that I say is the prophet of God. My dear friend, Brother Williams, just preached to us so powerfully. Every word that I say is going to increase because my word has power and anointing. So I, I must decrease and he must increase. My Lord, how we need to get this simple principle in the word of God. Kingdom minded people doesn't care who gets the credit. They all care. The only thing they care about it is advancing the kingdom of God. And I'm about to finish here. The ten virgins in the Bible and the New Testament represents the whole church. Ten virgins. Five 50% of them, 50% of the church were sellers of oil keepers. They were there. They five, 50% had oil. The Bible says the other 50% didn't have no oil. I would to say here tonight 
that the 50% that they didn't, they didn't have all your, I'm not going to say they didn't love the Lord. They were not apt to, apt to doing things in the church. They were not preaching. They were unsure they were doing all of those things. I dare to say here that they have a burden to reach the lost. But they were doing all of those things without the oil of the anointing. They were trying to accomplish things with the arm of flesh. And you are extremely limited if you try to accomplish things with the arm of flesh. But if you can get him involved and you get involved in his business and you take care of his business, he's going to take care of our business. He's going to take care of our vision. He's going to help us to reach. He's going to help us to go forward. He's going to help us to get there. But without a God, without a deep relationship with the Lord, we ain't going nowhere. We'll be a stop. We'll be a stop. We got to get deeper than what we see in the external. I guess what I'm saying is this. If you want to go to the next level, how many here, how many here we use that phrase, I want to go to the next level? I want to get to the next level? I, do you really want to go? Do you really want to get to the next level of growth and revival and faith and consecration and relationship with the Lord? You really want to do it? Well, you better go home. Because this is what I did 30, 25 years ago. I went home. And the first thing that I told the church, it's just a handful of group of people. I said, we're going to open up the cellars of oil. There's going to be prayer here every day, 5 o'clock in the morning. We start at 5. We're not going to have a time when we're going to finish. We're just going to open up the church every single day of the year. I don't care if it's a holiday. I don't care what it is. We, this church will be open for all of those that want to pray and seek the face of God. And we open up the cellars of oil. And in 1990, we were having a about 50, 60 people by 19, by 1998. We were so packed in a little building, our first building. We had 300 souls. We looked like sardines in the building. So I went out, we find this old, this building, this theater building. We completely remodeled it like a brand new from inside out and, 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 and everything with it. We just dedicated it. And the Lord has given us a revival that is beyond my imagination. I stand before you, not because of me, but in spite of me. The secret, the secret is to keep the sellers of oil going all the time. God has helped us to build a church. We have an English church in the morning and then we have a Spanish church in the afternoon. We have a, a close to a thousand coming in in the morning and we got 700 plus in the afternoon. 1700 plus people run to the church on Sundays. And then we got 12 other churches and three other churches having church all over the place at the same time. Let me tell you something. That is not, I'm not satisfied. I thank God for that. But it's not me. It's the keepers of the silence of oil. Those that pray. Those that fast. Those that give. Those that cry. And I thank you. Thank you, Pastor. It's an honor for me to call you, Pastor. You imparted something for me. It seems like in the last three years, all our fathers are dying. My dad just passed away two years ago. I was in my office on a Saturday. My past passed away on Thursday. And I was in my office by myself on a Saturday afternoon. I was broken heart. It's, it's, you can imagine, those that gone through that experience know what I'm talking about. My dad was my, my hero, my personal hero. And I was in my office. I just crying and reading. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to act. And all of a sudden, my cell phone rang. And I picked it up. It was Pastor Anthony Mangan. I said, wow. I answered. He said, I heard your dad passed away. And that day, that's the power of words, brother. What we just heard from the men of God. He spoke some words into my life. That's an afternoon. He says, you go tomorrow. You stand on the pulpit. And you preach with everything that you have. Because first of all, him, and second, your father, that's what they want you to do. Don't stay down, just go out there and do it. Boy, it was like, a, like if somebody put that 220 on my arms and my hands, and it just shook me up. And I got up from my stage of crying and depression, and I began to walk in my office, and I began to thank God for the life of my father, and those that had taught me many things. 
I thank God. And I went out Sunday and I preached like I never preached before. There was a special anointing that came upon me. It's like the mantle came over me and I preached and the Lord moved and there were healings and there were wonders and people received the Holy Ghost and people were healed and the precious name of Jesus. And if God did it with me, he can do it with anybody here. When you hurt, when you down, when you don't have resources, when you don't know which way to go, you need to go to the cellar and you need to pray and you need to cry and you need to seek the face of God. Because it's not, I think it is a tremendous privilege for me to be here today. I consider this a great honor. I thank God for the opportunity. Perhaps in the many eyes of you, because I'm Hispanic or because somebody's black, African American, or because somebody's yellow, Asian, sometimes we got all these ideas, all of these things. But thank God, our God, our God doesn't see the color of our skin. Our God doesn't see what country we come from. There are Hispanic people all over. Everybody, todos los que hablan español, pónganse de pie. Everyone, everybody that speaks Spanish is standing. I want you to see because of the times, the influence now of Hispanic people. And let me tell you something. They are here. They are legal. <laughs> they are contributing to society. They are great men of God. And they are touching the lives of people all over the United States. We got, we got Brother Stewart. He's a, a head of the a, a, a preach ministries which deals with the African Americans and all those cultures and God's given their revival hey this is an all flesh revival God is answering the prayers of the keepers of the sellers that for years and years and years have prayed, have fasted, have preached, have telling us and we not deluding the gospel we're going to be apostolics all the way we're going to preach this truth. We're going to practice it. Stand, please. We're not moving to the left. We're not moving to the right. Sister Lucille Farman, I'm going to tell Brother Howell, the, our foreign missions director. I was only mm, seven years old when Sister Lucille Farman came to the country of Ecuador, my native country. I was seven years old, 1964. Tall. I mean, she was so light complected that I thought she was transparent. She had blue eyes, blonde hair. 41 years old she had. She, she was 41 years old when she arrived in Ecuador. She didn't know a word of Spanish. She had a book. We had a hard time communicating. <laughs> but she came with just two luggages, three or four, whatever. And he says, I don't have a place to live. I'm the missionary for the United Pentecostal Church. That's how I used to be before, I guess. So my dad says, the only thing I got is this little room, eight by eight, concrete floor, nothing else, little bed, and she put him out there. I was only seven years old, every day, sometimes all night. This lady cried out, travailing before the Lord so loud, he woke us all up. I mean, oh, we all wake up. What's happening now? It was Sister Lucille Farmer travailing for the country of Ecuador. No wonder the little country of Ecuador shook under the power of God. In that church that my dad pastor in the city of Quito, that he, we started in the same building today, has more than 3,000 members. But it was because there were some oil keepers in the building. There was a missionary that didn't know a word of Spanish. They know the culture behind the passion and she wrote this book A Willing Heart I hope they reprint it again so we all can read it The Willing Heart and she says Sister Lucille Farman she was not a singer she knew how to play instruments she didn't know nothing of that stuff she had no talents no ability. for us she did not qualify but the one that's doing the qualifying is him and she used that little lady to put a seed in that country. Brother Tenney came and visited us. I love you, Brother Tenney. Oh, she, was we, she, 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 was she was a great woman. When she died, everything she owned in this world was in a little box under her bed. 
She didn't just go to Ecuador. Israel, one of the most sacrificial women that I ever knew in my life. One of the most humble. She just prayed and radiated the presence of God. And when she had that little box for the tent, I went to see her at that little room in Hood River, Oregon. Yeah. And I walked in that little room in the elderly home. It lay and there is a skin and bones. This lady that I knew 40, 50 years before, tall, healthy, blue eyes, blind. Now he was just left there in the, lay in the little bed. He said, Son, I told him who I was. He says, Elias, I don't have anything. I don't have anything for this world to give you, but please get that little box that is underneath my bed. <laughs> it's just a cardboard box. He says, take whatever you want out of there. I opened it up. There was pictures and there were things when I was a little, and the pictures of the work. And I took those pictures. And I said, Sister Farber, please pray for me. Transmit to me that spirit. Ain't yeah. those little hands there were bones and skins she was an oil keeper that's why the revival was going on in Ecuador yeah all these young preachers now they're enjoying it that's great but there was somebody in those little hands just bone skins they were placed on my head and when she prayed for me she was weak she had no strength but she had stronger hands than what I felt tonight when brother shot well those big old hands that he got sister fireman has some very bony scheme, but boy, we're so heavy with anointing. God, that's what I want. I don't care about anything else. I want to advance the kingdom of God. Take everything, God. But don't take from me that anointing and the power. And I wonder here today, there's some people, they are so concerned about these and images and all that. I wonder if I might be sincere group of young men, perhaps young couples, or missionaries, or anybody in this place that's interested to go back home and open up the cellars of oil. Break that luck. Years that you have been preaching. The church has done a lot of things, but they, they, they're not praying. They're not doing the things they're supposed to be doing. I wonder if here wants to impact the world like so, like Sister Best of Man. My Lord, you put that hand on my chest today imparted something to me like you did many years ago, my pastor. You, 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 uh, I blame on you everything that I do. And I, I, you transferred to me something. I, I cannot put it into words. I mean, but you transferred to me something. There's something inside of me. And I wonder here today. I know I'm not the best preacher. I know the Holy Ghost move here. I know my friend, my dear friend, Brother Mike Williams, preached such a powerful man. Oh, everything was great. But I wonder if somebody here don't care about the accolades, don't care about the recognition, don't care who gets the credit, as long as the kingdom of God is advancing and his name is being lifted up, then you say, I don't care, God, I don't leave this place until I'm touched by the anointing and the power, something genuine, God, that comes from the cellars of oil. I'm not living this place like I came. I'm living different. <laughs> We got ministries, we got people, we got we got multicultural ministry, brother Dan Hans, come on, Lord Jesus. What a man, 20 years in Pakistan now, serving communities here in the States. He not even knows their language and culture, but he has the passion. There's anybody up above in the balcony, it doesn't matter, you can kneel over there. Come on, listen, traveling. Let some tears come out. Say, God, give me what this man of God has. I might not be the most eloquent God. I might not be the most intelligent God. I might not have my words perfect like they should be. I might not have all the God. Somebody cry out. Somebody let it travel. I said, let it come on. 